desire to fit in. And this will be quite interesting to read to you. As you can see, individual effect, the desire to fit in. Let us say that you enter a group as part of a new job, for instance, as you try to adjust to the environment, you become aware that people are scrutinizing and judging you as the outsider. On a non-verbal level, you feel their eyes probing you for clues. You begin to wonder, do I fit in? Have I said the right things? What do they think of me? The first and primary effect on you in any group is the desire to fit in and cement your sense of belonging. The more you fit in, the less you pose a challenge to the group and its values. This will minimize the scrutiny you face and the anxiety that comes with it. The first way you do this is through appearances. You dress 
and present yourself more or less as the others do in the group. There are always a small percentage of people who like to stand out in their look, but manage to conform when it comes to ideas and values. Most of us, however, are uncomfortable looking too different, and we do what we do to blend in. We adopt the clothes and looks that say the right thing. I'm serious. I work hard. I may have style, but not so much that I stand out. The second and more important way you fit in is by adopting the ideas, beliefs, and values of the group. You may begin to use similar expressions as others, a sign of what's happening below the surface. Your own ideas slowly shape themselves to those of the groups. Some people may outwardly rebel against such conformity, but they are usually the type who are eventually fired or marginalized. You may hold on to a few particular beliefs or opinions that you largely keep to yourself. The second and more important way you fit in is by adopting the ideas, beliefs, and values of the group. You may begin to use similar verbal expressions as others, a sign of what's happening below the surface. Your own ideas slowly shape themselves into those of the group. Some people may outwardly rebel against such conformity, but they are usually the types who are eventually fired or marginalized. You may hold on to a few particular beliefs or opinions that you keep largely to yourself, but not on issues important to the group. The longer you are in the group, the stronger and more insidious this effect. If you observed this group from the outside, you would notice an overall uniformity of thinking that is quite surprising, considering that as individuals, we all differ quite a bit from one another in temperament and background. This is a sign of the subtle molding and conformity that takes place. You might have joined a group because you share their ideas and values, but you will find over time that the parts of your thinking that were a little different from others, reflecting your uniqueness, are slowly trimmed away, like a shrub made to match the others, so that in almost all issues, you agree with the group. You are not aware of all this as it is happening to you. It occurs unconsciously. In fact, you will tend to very intensely deny such conformity has ever taken place. 
you will imagine that you have come upon these ideas on your own, that you have chosen to think and believe this and think that. You don't want to confront the social force operating. Thank you, BDC. <laughs> you don't want to confront the social force operating on you and causing you to blend in and enhance your sense of belonging. In the long run, it is much better to confront your conformity to the group ethos so that you become aware of it as it happens and control the process to some degree. Number two, the need to perform. This is good for everyone in chat. It's good for me. It's good for you. If you feel the need to perform sometimes, especially in groups and when you're on your own, maybe you slack on yourself a little bit more. This is going to be interesting. And it's my first time reading this part of the book as well, as it's not a story, but chapters about different parts of the human nature, I suppose. So let's dive into it together, shall we? The need to perform. Stemming from this first effect is the second effect. In the group setting, we are always performing. It is not just that we conform in appearances and thinking, but that we exaggerate our agreement and show others that we belong. In the group, we become actors molding what we say and do so that others accept and like us and see us as a loyal team member. Our performance change depending on the size of the group and its particular makeup. Bosses, colleagues, our friends, colleague. <laughs> we might begin with a degree of inner distance in these performances, aware, for instance, that we are being unusually obsequious around the boss. But over time, in acting the part, we begin to feel what we are showing. The inner distance melts away, and the mask we wear fuses into our personality. Instead of thinking to smile in appropriate moments, we automatically paste on <laughs> the smile. <laughs> That's pretty true. <laughs> As part of this performance, we minimize our flaws and display what we consider our strength. We put on confidence. We act more altruistic. Studies have shown that we are much more likely to help someone cross the road when others are looking at us. In the group, we make sure that people we see support the right causes. We post our progressive opinions prominently on social media. 
We also make sure others see us working hard and putting in extra hours. When we are alone, we often rehearse in our minds things we will say or do for our next performance. Do not imagine that it is better to simply be your natural self or to rebel against this. There is nothing more unnatural than curbing this need to perform, which even a chimpanzee <laughs> display to a high degree. If you want to seem natural, as if you are comfortable with yourself, you have to act the part. You have to train yourself to not feel nervous and to shape your appearance so that in your naturalness you don't offend people or the group values. Those who refuse to soak and refuse to perform end up marginalized as the group unconsciously expels such types. In any event, you should feel no shame about this need. There is nothing you can do about it anyway since in the group we unconsciously mold our behavior to fit in. Better to be aware, to retain that inner distance, and to transform yourself into a conscious and superior actor, capable of altering your expression, to fit the subgroup, and impressing people which are positive qualities. <laughs> Hello everyone in chat. That part of the book certainly talks to me and probably many of you. And now we will jump into emotional contagion. So, let's get into it. When we are babies, we were highly sensitive to the moods and emotions of our mother. Her smiles elicited our own. Her anxiety made us tense. We evolved at this high degree of empathy to the emotions of the mother as a survival mechanism long ago. Like all social animals, we are primed from an early age to sense and pick up the emotions of others, particularly those close to us. This is the third effect of the group on us, the contagiousness of emotions. When we are alone, we are aware that our shifting moods, of our shifting moods, but the moment we enter the group and feel the eyes of others upon us, we become aware, on an unconscious level, of their moods and emotions, which, if strong enough, can displace our own. In addition, 
among those whom we feel comfortable and sense that we belong, we are less defensive and more vulnerable to the contagious effect. Certain emotions are more contagious than others, anxiety and fear being the strongest of all. Among our ancestors, if one person sensed a danger, it was important that others feel this as well. But in our present environment, where the threats are less immediate, it is more like a low-grade anxiety that passes quickly through the group, triggered by possible or imagined dangers. Other highly contagious emotions are joy and excitement, tiredness and apathy, and intense anger and hatred. Desire is also highly contagious. If we see that others want to possess something or follow a new trend, we are easily infected with the same impulse. All of these effects have a self-fulfilling dynamic. If three people are feeling anxious, there must be a good reason for it. Now, we become the fourth, and it gains a reality that others find compelling. The more people who feel it, the more others will catch it. And the more intense it becomes within us as individuals. You can observe this in yourself by looking at your own emotions in the moment and trying to decipher the effect others might have had on them. Is it the fear you are feeling related to something confronting you in an immediate sense? Or is it more secondhand, derived from what you have heard or sensed from others? Try to catch this as it occurs. Discern which emotions are the most contagious for you and how your emotions shift with the various groups and subgroups that you pass through. Awareness of this gives you the power to control it. And I will never allow you to forget how powerful you are. Does this resonate with you and chat about emotional contagion? Next one is hyper certainty. And these are all effects and reactions that we can have when we are in groups. So let's get into it. Hyper certainty. When we are on our own and think about our decisions and plans, we naturally feel doubts. Have we chosen the right career path? Did we say the right thing 
to get the job? Are we adopting the best strategy? But when we are in the group, this doubting, reflective mechanism is neutralized. Let us say the group has to decide of an important strategy. We feel the urgency to act, arguing. We feel the urgency to act, arguing, and the liberating is tiring, and where will it end? We feel the pressure to decide and get behind the decision. If we dissent, we might be marginalized or excluded and we recoil from such possibilities. Furthermore, if everyone seems to agree that this is the right course of action, we are compelled to feel confident about the decision. And so, the fourth effect on us is to make us feel more certain about what we and our colleagues are doing, which makes us all the more prone to taking risks. I hope that you enjoy. reason I quite like books like this, as much as it is an opinion, it gives us some insight on why we react and act the way we do. And when we are aware, it's easier to change. I know this book talks a lot about controlling emotions, but I think that's the first step. The goal is not just to control your emotions, but it's to 